the Holy Spirit is sent, he comes for you to save you. The Holy Spirit, this, this divine person, is, 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 he comes in you to change you. And finally, this divine person, the Holy Spirit, he comes upon you to send you. I want to repeat that, friends, because this is the summary of the whole study that we did last week. Number one, the Holy Spirit comes for you to save you. Number two, the Holy Spirit comes in you to change you. And lastly, the Holy Spirit comes upon you to send you. Is that easy to remember, yes or no? Save you, change you, send you. But let me ask you this question, friends. Okay, so this is what the Holy Spirit does. But how do I know that I have received the Holy Spirit? How what is that sign that, I, that testifies of me receiving this divine person? How do I know that I have received the Holy Spirit? How do we know? Well, it takes a sign. It does take a sign. Because the only way for you to see that you have, you have been filled by the Holy Spirit is what you are, who you are. And so some people propose though, some people propose, listen to me. Some people propose that the way you know that the Holy Spirit has, been, has come upon you, that is in you, that has come to save you, is through the gifts you have. Because of the gifts you have, they said, okay, that person is filled by the Holy Spirit. But even more, some other people say that the way you know the Holy Spirit has come into you, has come upon you, and has come for you, is because of the gift. And they consider that one gift... To be the one that shows that you are filled by the Holy Spirit. Does anyone here know what we're talking about? They call it, or the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues. And what these, these denominations believe, these churches believe, they believe that once you start speaking in tongues, the way they define it, that means that is a proof, that is the sign that you are Filled by the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you are not using that gift, then that means that you are not filled by the Holy Spirit. So here is here's, here's a thesis for this morning, friends. Is that what the Bible teaches? Because I, okay, I, I can hear all many scholars, all many people, bright people, educated people saying these kind of things. But I want to know what God says. I want to know what the Bible teaches. And I want to invite you to go in a journey through the Bible to see what is the sign that the Bible actually teaches to be the sign that shows that you have been filled by the Holy Spirit. Let me start with this gift of tongues. Let me tell you, the gift of tongues is actually biblical, is genuine, and, and we actually accept it it's the, in the Bible. The gift of tongues is an actual gift. It's a genuine gift. Now, the word tongue comes from the Greek uh, glossa. Glossa is the Greek for tongue. And a more common way to translate or to understand that word glossa is the word language. Language, like Samoan, like Spanish, like English, like friend, uh, uh, French, and so on. A language is a glossa. So every time you find the word tongue in the Bible actually comes from Glossa sometimes refers to the member, that, that little organ that is in your mouth, tongue. In, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament as well. That is the word found in the Bible. There is another term that we have to be familiar with, and that is, that is the word glossolalia. The word glossolalia now is, is, a, word, is a word that, that defines this um, unintelligible or ecstatic utterances. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here, friends? You want me to give an example? They go like sabala, sabala, babala, sabala, sabala, babala, sabala, and they call that the gift of tongues. Is that what the Bible says? Hey, 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 let me tell you, friends, I respect every, anyone that believes that way, but I want to, friends, study what God says. And the only reason why I use that is just to show that this is what they call the gift of tongues. But we want to see if that is actually what God calls the gift of tongues. So there are three occasions in the whole, in the whole record 
of the, the primitive, the apostolic church that, that gives us all the events that took place around the gift of tongues in the book of Acts. Only three times. That is Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19. And what, what I want to do with you, friends, is to invite you through a journey through these three times, only three times, where this event takes place along with the filling of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 2, you know this, we find the day of what, friends? Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is found in Acts chapter 2. What took place there? The disciples were in one accord, in one place. They were praying. They were submitting their, their, their lives to the Lord. They were in one accord. And when they were in one accord and finally surrendering their lives to the Lord, what happened, friends? The Holy Spirit came upon them. But the Holy Spirit manifested at this point as tongues of fire. Tongues of fire. So when that happened, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the author of the book of Acts tells us that there were people from all over the nations. As a matter of fact, let me see. Um, um, Acts chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Let's, let's read this part. It's very important. It says, and when this sound occurred. So, so they started speaking. At that moment, they were filled by the Holy Spirit, and they started speaking. Many people would say that what they started saying was something like, Sabala, babala, sabala, sabala, babala. Is that what the Bible says? Listen to, listen to this. It was a sound that, that they were making. But listen to what it says. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. There were thousands of people uh, uh, witnessing what was taking place with the disciples, the apostles. And all of them were confused. And if you stop there, you will say they were confused because they were saying these things that don't have any meaning. But this is what they were confused. And I praise God because he doesn't leave this open. He closes all the gaps so that you and I will not be confused. Because, he says, everyone heard them, what? Sabala, babala, sabala. No. They speak in his own language. Language. Then they were all amazed. What, what is weird about this language? Do you remember who the apostles were? The apostles were Galileans. No one is surprised. Okay, let me talk on this side. Okay. The apostles, they were fishermen. They were humble people. They didn't go to school. They didn't study any language. How is it that people that barely knew a, di a dialect of Aramaic was speaking other languages? How can that happen? That's what they were surprised. Let's continue reading. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, listen to, listen to the Bible. Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born. Okay, friends, when you go to Acts chapter 2, you will see a list of people, uh, of the places that people came from. So what was taking place at this moment was one of the greatest celebrations, Jewish celebration, where which you were um, responsible and obligated, I would say, to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. So, so adults... Uh, anyone over 12 years old will come to Jerusalem to celebrate this. And so there were people from all over the world because at this moment, the Jewish were scattered in the world. So they will come to this place and people from all over the world will be there. Do we speak the same language in the whole world? No, that means that the reason why Luke is describing, I believe Luke is the author of the book of of, of Acts, he's describing all these people and where they come from is because he wants you to know that all these people speak different or spoke different languages. And because they spoke different languages, there was a need of breaking a barrier of communication. Breaking what, friends? A barrier of communication. And because there was a barrier of communication that need, needed to be broken. God gave the gift of tongues to the apostles so that they can communicate the gospel to these people. Language. So these were all known languages. What we are talking about in Acts chapter 2. This is the first time, friends. The very first time that we find this, uh, the, this gift actually being exercised, exercised in, in Acts 
chapter 2. And again, you can read verses 8 all the way down and you will see, uh, you will see all these people um, uh, named by the name of their places where they're coming from. Different languages. So when it comes to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 testifies that the gift of tongues is actually the speaking of an actual known language. Okay, the, the first time. How about the second time? How about the second time? The second time that we find in the book of Acts is Acts chapter 10. I already told you. So we go to Acts chapter 10 now, and you know what happened in Acts chapter 10. Peter is visited by the Holy Spirit through a dream, and he's, he's shown all these clean and unclean animals. And the instruction was, rise and kill. And then Peter says, no, yo, I never touch unclean animals. And then God said, whatever I have made clean, don't call it unclean. You know this, right friends? At the same time that God was visiting Peter with this dream, and dream didn't take this as, as food, by the way. He didn't know what it meant. So he was passive. He didn't know the meaning of it until God revealed the meaning of it. So at the same time, or, or, or moments before, um, God also visited a, a, an individual by the name of, does anyone know? Cornelius. Let me take you there. Acts chapter 10, verses we are just going to read 1 and 46 of this story. Because here's where we are going to get the information of why this is happening in Acts chapter 10, the gift of tongues. It says, verse 1, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. What does that tell you, the name of this person? He was Roman. He was Roman. Tell me, friends, what kind of language will, uh, did a Roman speak? Latin. It was Latin, right? There was no Roman. There is no Roman language for somebody. There is no Roman language. Latin is what they spoke. So, so Cornelius was a Latin speaking. And then he says a centurion, in case you were not sure that he was a Roman. Cornelius was a Roman. There was um, um, a language, a language barrier again, a barrier of communication here that uh, Luke is telling us about and not just that but he says of what was called the Italian regiment why would Luke give this information because he wants you to know that Italians speak what language Italian so so far we have two different languages at least because remember the centurions they only they only had hundreds of soldiers under their authority they also had slaves they also have servants they all have also had people that served them that normally were from the population where they were living at this moment where were they living at this moment palestine israel all that area so the servants most likely also spoke different languages like hebrew maybe greek or maybe aramaic so all these languages called for a bridge. There was something that separated them, but they needed to be united so that they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and accept the Savior. Verse 46 says, so, so Peter is brought to the house of Cornelius. And, and Peter preaches the gospel to them. And they accept Jesus Christ as the Savior. Peter baptized them. And as soon as Peter does that, the Holy Spirit falls upon these who were Gentiles. And as a result of this, they start speaking in tongues. And you will say, but it doesn't say that this is different from Acts chapter 2. Well, in Acts chapter 11, in Acts chapter 11, Peter, recounting what took place in Acts chapter 10, will say the following. Listen to me, friends. Ele uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 15. He would, say, he would say, and as I began to speak, retelling the story of what happened in Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Listen to this part. As upon us at the beginning. Which beginning? Acts chapter 2. So whatever happened in Acts chapter 10 was the same event in, in the context of, of uh, uh, speaking in tongues. The same event that took place in chapter 2. Yes or no, friends? You still with me? So in Acts chapter 2, only three times in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, in the whole Bible, by the way, is the only two, three times that we find the gift of tongues related with the filling of the Holy Spirit. Only three times in the whole Bible. Number one, Acts number two. Number two, 
Acts number 10. Number three. So in number two, simply we learn that this, the, the gift of tongues is simply speaking in a known language, in an intelligent language, intelligible language. In Acts chapter 10, we find the same thing because Acts chapter 11 corroborates that. And it says that this gift of tongues is actually a known intelligible language. Language is not an aesthetic utterance, at least so far, right? And then we move to the last one, Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, we find Paul, Paul now, not Peter, but Paul coming to um, a Greek city. Paul is coming to what kind of city? A Greek city. Why do we need to know that it was a Greek city? No one? Language, right? They speak Greek there, right? Yes or no, friends? You still here? I need you awake. I definitely need you awake here. Listen, listen to what verse 1 says. You don't believe me, let me read the Bible to you. So we are in 19 verse 1. That Paul, talking about the Apostle Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to, where friends? Ephesus. And finding some disciples, there were 12 disciples there that were from Ephesus, that were Gentiles, that, that Paul came to and taught them a little more and told them about the Holy Spirit, by the way. And then they were baptized. And because they were taught by the Holy Spirit, they accepted Jesus Christ and they were baptized. They what? They spoke in tongues. They received the gift of tongues. But... What, how can we know that this is actually the same event that happened in chapter 2 and in chapter 10? Why not? It has to be the same event. Why, friends? Because the Bible never contradicts itself. Because there are not two different gift of tongues. If the gift of tongues is an actual language in Acts chapter 2, the gift of tongues has to be an actual language in Acts chapter 10. If the gift of tongues was an actual language in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10, 10, then it has to be an actual language in Acts chapter 19. Does that make sense, friends? Look what verse 6, 6 says. Acts 19, verse 6. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. What you're going to see as common is every time a, a, a person is given this gift of tongues is because there is a necessity. What is that necessity? To break that communication barrier. Right? It's given because God wants everyone to hear the gospel of his son. Why is God so after people listening and, and receiving the gospel? Because that, the gospel is life. Without the gospel, you're dead. Without the gospel, you're lost. Without the gospel, you're doomed. And so God, your Father, He's after you because He wants you to receive His Son, the only way to salvation. Let me ask you this, this question, friends. We saw already the only cases, three of them, in the book of Acts. In the whole Bible is the only time that the gift of tongues is actually exercised in the whole Bible. Right? Actual cases. Can we conclude that the, the gift of tongues is the sign that shows that you are filled by the Holy Spirit? If the, if that, if the answer to that question is yes, as most of you are saying, we will be in trouble. You know why? Because if you are not filled by the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. But according to what, what we, we, the, the other people believe... If you are not filled by the Holy Spirit, you don't speak the, if you are, don't speak the, the gift of tongues, if you don't have the gift of tongues, then you are not filled by the Holy Spirit. But if you are not filled by the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. In other words, everyone who is not, who is not practicing this kind, the kind of, the kind of uh, uh, gift of tongues that they want us to believe in, then you are not filled by the Holy Spirit. Do you see the seriousness of these friends? So let me ask you this question again. Think about the question, please. Think about the question. So far, is the gift of tongues the sign of the Holy Spirit? The manifestation of the, of the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? No, friends. Because if it were, if it were, we wouldn't be in trouble. Because I can make it up as many of them do. I know this. 
right? I can make it up. But making it up doesn't make it genuine. The way that, the, uh, the, the fact that I can say, sabala, sabala, babala, sabala, sabala, doesn't mean that I have the gift of tongues. Doesn't mean that I have the gift of tongues, friends. And you know, do you know that many people fake this because they know that once you don't speak the gift of tongues, that means that you, the Holy Spirit doesn't have you. Or even worse, you don't have the Holy Spirit as if the Holy Spirit were to have a thing to have. It's serious. It's serious, friends. So the answer to that question so far in what we have seen, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19, the answer is no, that is not the sign. Because if, if it were the sign, every one of us should be speaking in tongues. And last thing I checked, Brit can only speak English. And he will only speak English the rest of his life. And even broken English. So, friends, no, no, but I know, I know, I know God has a, has, has, has a hold on bread. I know he's filled by the Holy Spirit. I know he's saved. I know he has received the Lord, but I haven't seen him speaking in tongues. It cannot be, friends, because then everyone should be speaking in tongues. You still with me, friends? Is that clear? Yes or no? It's going to be a long journey this morning. Is that all right? I'm preaching this today, friends, because we're feeding you this afternoon. You stay for lunch, so don't worry about food. We will feed you. But for us to feed you, you have to stay longer here. If the gift of tongues were that sign of the Holy Spirit, then I will expect more than three times in the whole Bible. Why only three times? As a matter of fact, let me give you more, more, more statistics. Um, statistics. Some of you are very prone to numbers, so let me give you some numbers. In the New Testament, how many books do we have in the New Testament? 27, thank you. In the New Testament, 50 times the word tongue is mentioned. How many times? 50. Listen to me. Only two books out of the 27 mention that. Only two books. I mean, if it were so important, don't you think a little more than just two out of 27 will do it? But only two. Those two books are, can you guess the first book? Acts. The second book that, the second book that is part of those two that I just told you about is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. So the book of Acts and 1 and Corinthians are the only two books in the whole New Testament where you find the gift of tongues. Now, the book of Acts that I already uh, uh, walked you through is the book of Acts has 28 chapters. The word tongue is only mentioned four times. In four chapters, I mean. Only four times are out of the 28, 28 chapters. And you, you remember that the book of Acts is the, the chronicle, it chronicles the, the life of the church. Another name for the book of Acts, in my estimation, is the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit. Right, Elsa? If the book of Acts is the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit, then you should see the Holy Spirit everywhere. And you do. Chapter after chapter, throughout all the 28 chapters, you will see the Holy Spirit present. But if, if, listen to me, if the, the, the gift of tongues were the, the manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit, you should see that gift of tongues every one of those chapters where the Holy Spirit is. Do you? No. Only four chapters mention the gift of tongues out of 28. That should say a lot about what we're dealing with. Now, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians has 16 chapters. How many friends? 16 chapters. Only three chapters mention the gift of tongues. Only three chapters. Right in the, the actual cases are uh, and uh, are mentioned in the book of Acts as we already saw, and First Corinthians actually those three cases are comparison. What are they? Comparisons or contrast. What the the, the Paul the author of First Corinthians does in chapter twelve of First Corinthians is to compare the gift of tongues with other gifts. In chapter thirteen of First Corinthians, what he does is to compare the gift of tongues with love. 
chapter 13. And finally, in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, he compares the gift of tongues with prophesying. So all that he does, Paul, is to compare the gift of tongues in those three chapters out of 16 with other gifts. You stay with me, friends. So this, and when he, when he does the comparison, and this is important, when you come to chapter 12, the gift of tongues is given as part of a list. As part of a list. And if that list corresponds to priority, let me tell you something. Out of that list, the gift of tongues is the less important. And when you come to chapter 13, what do you think is more important? To speak in tongues or to love? That's what Paul says in chapter 13. That the gift of tongues is less important than love. And when he comes to chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, again, again, he says that prophesying is more important than speaking in tongues. Is it a sign? What do you think? It cannot be. Otherwise, it would be more important than loving. It would be more important than, than prophesying. It would be more important than any other gift. You stay with me, friends? How about 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14? How about those? Because it seems to be that, uh, especially chapter 14, talks about a mystery. It talks about a language of angels or heavenly language. It talks about praying in the Spirit. Why are you denying this? Well, so far, what do we know so far? The book of Acts teaches that the gift of tongues is actually talking about known languages. Actual languages. Did you stay with me, friends? So what about 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14? Before we get into chapter 12, 13, and 14, we need to know what's taking place there. Why these chapters are given. Let me share it this way. This, uh, this person, he wanted to, to conduct. His, his, his conducting style, however, was idiosyncratic. In other words, sometimes he was, he was doing soft passages. When he was doing soft passages, he crouched extremely low. For loud sections, um, he'd often leap into, into the air, even shouting to the orchestra. His memory was poor. Once, one, one time he forgot that he had instructed the orchestra not to repeat a section of music while they were performing. When he went back to repeat that section that he, they told, they, they, he told them not to repeat, they went forward. So he stopped the piece, hollering, stop, wrong. That will not do again, again. From his, his, for his own piano concerto, he tried conducting from, from the piano. At one point, he jumped from the bench, bumping the candle off the piano. In another, in another concert, he knocked over the choir boy. During, during one long, delicate passage, he jumped high to cue a loud entrance, but nothing happened because he had lost count and signaled the orchestra too soon. As his hearing worsened, musicians tried to ignore his conducting and get their cues from the violinist. Finally, the musicians pled with him to go home and give up conducting, which he did. He was Lungfeng van Beethoven. As the man who may, many consider to be the greatest composer of all times learned, no one is genius of all traits. And that is why, my dear friends, gifts need to be distributed among the members of the body of Christ for for the edification of the body. That's why we find 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Because one person cannot be good at everything. 
So instead of giving one, one um, gift to one, all the gifts to one person, what God does is that He distributes all the gifts among the members of the body of Christ as He pleases. Now, friends, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is what the Bible says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Before we go to chapter 14, we need to see the context. This is what 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. What is the next word? Distributing to each one individually. See, if we are to believe that the gift of tongues is the one sign, the sign, the manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, then everyone will is to receive it. But that's not what the Bible says. Because the Holy Spirit is who decides which gifts to give to which person individually as he wills. Is that what the Bible says? Yes or no, friends? Now we jump to verse 27 in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is the, the chapter before the, the, the loving chapter in chapter 13 and before chapter 14 where we come back to the gift of tongues. Verse 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Again, individually. It's not like here, everyone receive the gift of tongues. That's not what God does. And continue saying, verse 28, And God has appointed this in the church. Listen to the list. There is a reason why the Paul uses first, second, third. It says first, apostles. Second, gift of tongues. Is that what, this, what it says, Patty? Patty, is that what it says? Is that, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, administrations. And finally, finally, the last one in the list, varieties of tongues. And if you're not sure about that list, why is this given the last and not the first one? He continues saying in verse, in verse 29, listen to the rhetorical questions. In other words, these questions have, have a given answer, a given negative answer. So answer it with me, friends. Whatever you think is the answer to these questions, you answer it with me. Verse 29, are all apostles, yes or no? We don't know. Are we all apostles? Yes or no? No. Are all prophets? Are we all prophets? Yes or no? Are all teachers? Can everyone teach? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have gifts of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? Yes. We already have a half an hour together. You don't know the answer to this question? I'm going to sit down. Right? All the answers to all the questions are no, and when we come to the gift of tongues, is yes. So Paul is asking these questions because at this point, he, he, he uh, considers that you already understand that this is a no again. Not everyone is given the gift of tongues, friends. If the gift of tongues were the sign of the Holy Spirit, of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, then it should be given to each person. But the reality is that it hasn't been given to everyone. And among those that say that they speak in tongues, even among them you find people that fake it. So speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the best gifts. Listen to this. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. Do you know that verse 31 is the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 12? So he's preparing. He's preparing you for what is coming in chapter 13. What is coming in chapter 13? The more excellent way. In other words, if you don't speak in tongues... This is the one that you have to pursue. What is the sign that you have been filled by the Holy Spirit? What is the sign that the members of the body of Christ have been filled by the Holy Spirit? That they love each other. 
Not that they speak in tongues. What is that the more excellent way? And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the chapter before chapter 14, which is the chapter that we are going to end our study with this morning. Now listen, friends, in chapter 13, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, let me ask you this question. Is Paul saying that he speaks the languages, the language of angels? Yes or no? How do you know? What? What do you say? How do you know that Paul is not saying that he speaks the language of, of, of angels? Because of that little word in the beginning that says, though. You know what though is? It's a supposition. It's a supposition. He is, he is using a, a, a hyper, hyperbole. A hyperbole is a rhetorical, a rhetorical way to ask, to say things. He is speaking hypothetically here, friends. He's not saying that he speaks the tongues of angels. He's saying, even if I do that, because he's about to teach something else. And that's why he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging symbol. If I don't have love, even if I speak this, the language of angels, I'm nothing. Is he talking about literally? Is he a symbol? Is Paul, is Paul a symbol? He's not. He's talking symbolically. He's talking hyperbolically. He's talking about a, 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 a hypothesis. That's what he's doing. So don't take it literally. He's trying. Let me put it this way. An easy way to understand this. He is exaggerating. To make a point. He's exaggerating. He's not saying that he does that. He's just exaggerating so that you, you understand how important love is. If you don't believe me, let's continue reading. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy. And Paul did have that gift. And understand all mysteries. Let me ask you this question. Did Paul understand all mysteries? The answer is no. So he's not saying that he understands all mysteries. He's supposing. He's using a hyper, hy hyperbole. Oh, difficult word. He says, and I understand all mysteries. That, did he understand all mysteries? No. And all knowledge. Did he have all knowledge? No. He's supposing to exaggerate so that you can get the point. Love is extremely important. And though I have all faith. Did he have all faith? No. So that I could remove mountains. He, do you ever read Paul removing mountains? He didn't do it. It was, he was supposing, he was exaggerating, but had not love, I am nothing. So he's not saying that he speaks the language of angels. He's just exaggerating to make a point. Again, he's speaking rhetorically. He's supposing, he's using hyperbole. All those things, all those, all those tools of of grammar and, and, and language to explain the point. Now, friends, Paul is not saying that then in chapter, uh, is not saying that then in chapter 13. But what I want to tell you now that we move to chapter 14, which is the last, last chapter, is that tongues are not for believers. The biblical gift of tongues is real, is genuine, it does come in the Bible. And God has given it to, me, to some people as he sees fit. But it's not for everyone. It hasn't been given to everyone. And it doesn't have to do with any, any ecstatic, ecstatic utterance. Or sabala, babala, sabala, babala. Why not? Sabala, babala, sabala. Why not? Why not, friends? Because you will not be benefited if I do that. What would you get? What would you get if I use that? Nothing. So in Corinth, there was a problem. Every time you read a, a, a letter from Paul, that letter is to fix a problem in the local church because Paul was their pastor. He would write these letters to address a problem. What was the problem? The, the city of Corinth was a port. Do you know what happens in port? You, of, any, of all the people, you should know what happens at port. Just look around, friends. Ports attract people from all over the world. That's what Paul do. 
Have you seen our Samoan community here? Have you, have you seen how big it is? Why here in Tacoma? Why here? Because this is a port. Why Seattle? Because this is a port. It's easier for people from other countries that are on this side of the world to come to this place before they go anywhere else, even California, because it's a port. Corinth was also a port. So people from all over the world would come to, to, uh, to Corinth, the city where the, uh, the church of Corinth was. And so what was the problem that was happening in the church? They had the gift of tongues. And they will come and everyone, because the gift of tongues was given for them to testify, to prophesy, they will come and just speak without order. And how many of you know that God, our God, is a God of order? And so he did, Paul, God impressed Paul to correct this and he gives the guideline of how to use the gift of tongues. That's what uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is. And so, and so Paul understood that a person coming to speak to another language, to a community that spoke this other language, was not, benefic uh, was not beneficial for them. And, and so he said, the, he said the guidelines on how to do this. It's just like, friends, it's just like, how many Spanish speakers are here in this place? One, two, three. Two, three, four. Few. It's like I, I start saying, Nuestro Dios es grandioso y, he, y Él es poderoso. Nuestro Dios quiere llenar nuestro corazón. Él quiere guiarnos en toda nuestra vida. Él quiere llenarnos de su amor. How many of you besides those two, that, those four that raised their hands understood that? How much benefit will I bring to you if I start speaking in the other language that I speak? None. That's why the Lord says, so you are, that's why the Lord says through Paul, this is how you use it. When you are to speak, this is how you do it. So this is what we learn from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Tongues are not for believers edification, but to confirm the unbelievers. Do we see that in Acts chapter 2? Yes. Do we see that in Acts chapter 10? Yes. Do we see that in Acts chapter 19? Yes. But for them, the unbeliever, to be confirmed, they need to understand what is being spoken. You with me, friends? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22 says, Therefore, tongues, glossa, language, are for a sign, not the sign, but a sign, not to those who believe, but to whom, friends? Unbelievers. But prophesying, remember that chapter 14 is a comparison between the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. And according to Paul, the gift of prophecy is greater than the gift of tongues. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So what are languages, church? What are languages for? Tell me, what are languages for? Languages are to break the barriers of communication and transmit in the case of of the gift of tongues in the case of trans, uh, of the gift of tongues and transmit the gospel to people because God wants to save everyone and so we saw, we see that in Acts chapter 2 everything that Paul talks about in chapter 12 13 and 14 is about intelligible talking speaking no sabala babala sabala no friends it's not that let me read it. Let me read it for you to see it. Verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14, verse 6. But now, brethren, Paul is speaking. If I come to you speaking with tongues. Now, how many languages did the author of, of the book of, uh, of the letter to the 1 Corinthians spoke? Do you know? So Paul, he was a Roman citizen, Latin. He was a Jew, Hebrew. He lived in Greek, ter Greek territory, Greek, right? So, and, and he was also a Hebrew, Aramaic, right? So you have all those languages that Paul spoke. So when he would say, I speak many languages, more than many here, he was right. He was an educated person and he, he knew all these languages, but the one that knew all the languages, and that te this tells us that we are not talking about a language that you learned because you were born in the States, you speak English. That's not the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is a miracle that happens at the moment that God sees somebody that needs to receive his son. He gives you the way to communicate with that person. It's a miracle. 
Paul says, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, and check that if, it's like the door, right? Supposing, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or, or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, they need to understand how will it be known what is piped or played. For if a trumpet, verse 8, makes a, a certain sound, how will prepare for battle? So likewise, in the same way that the instruments need to make a certain sound so that you will understand what is being played, in the same way, he will say, he will say, likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand. Sabala, babala. Somebody translate for me. Sabala, babala, sabala, babala. Somebody. So he says, he says, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known by what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. And he says, verse, verse 10, there are, it may be, so many kinds of languages where is Paul talking about known languages or, or uh, unintelligible utterances? He's talking about known languages. Languages that are spoken in the world. That's what he says. And none of them is without significance. He knows. He knows what he's talking about. In verse 11 it says, Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of that language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks. And he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. We cannot communicate. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the, what? Oh, the gifts of God are given for the edification of the body of Christ. If you speak a unknown, nonsense, noise, how many of are you benefiting? Not even yourself because you do not understand what you are saying. Of the church that you seek to excel, it says in verse 12. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, is a solution for these, these men that they were creating in the church. And Paul didn't want that in his church. And he starts saying, when you exercise the gift of tongues, because the gift of tongues is genuine and is biblical. When you exercise that gift of tongues, remember to do it one at a time. Remember to do it two or three or no more than three people at a time. And always, always use an interpreter. In other words, a translator. Right? It's like, it's like if Ben wants to come up and preach. Somebody from Samoa, in Samoa, somebody from Samoa should come up and translate it into, into what? English, so that everyone else can understand. Friends, God is the God of order. And what happens in the church has to be for everyone's benefit. Now, how about verse 2? See, after all this explanation, and the Bible speaks really clear. We come to verse 2. The one that everyone uses to, to say, See, you can speak other language even if no one understands. Verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But let me tell you a simply, simple rule of interpretation of the Bible. You don't make doctrines out of the difficult passages. You make doctrines out of the clear passages. So we already study all the clear passages and we learn something. The gift of tongues is an actual in, intelligible language. That's what the Bible clearly teaches, right? Now we come to this that is a little more dif difficult in demanding to more demanding to understand. But when you come to those difficult passages, remember all the background, all the context that you have to come in there. And this is how we are going to end. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. It says, For he who is speaking in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. See? No matter. No, it doesn't matter if others understand. You can say, Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. God will know. That's not what Paul is saying. Listen, friends. For no one understands him. Right? He doesn't speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, listen, friends. This refers to a situation in which someone who speaks a foreign language in a context in which the language is not understood or is not understood it speaks to God only. Why is it that he speaks to God only? Because God can understand all languages. If I start right now praying in Spanish, will God understand me? Yes or no? Besides the four people that raised their hands, no one else will understand my prayer. But God will understand because Spanish is an actual language. That's what he's saying. So the gift of tongues in Corinth, in this church, was a genuine gift of the Holy Spirit. But it was being misused. That's why the church was instructed by Paul to return to the right use of the spiritual gift. So that they could become a blessing and not a hindrance for believers and unbelievers. Let's settle this. Let's settle this. What about Jesus? What is Jesus in all this? What about Jesus? Go through the Gospels. Go everywhere Jesus is mentioned. No one time you see Jesus speaking a, a, a static utterances. Nowhere in the Bible. If that glossalia is, uh, is, uh, the, the, uh, is the manifestation of the sign of the Holy Spirit, don't you think the one that was filled by the Holy Spirit should use it? But nowhere you find Jesus speaking in tongues in that way. Nowhere. But I can tell you that Jesus knew more than one language. That he used it powerfully to reach out to more people uh, and bring it to salvation. So Jesus never spoke in, in these unintelligible words. As a matter of fact, Jesus discouraged vain repetitions. Now listen friends, if Jesus discouraged vain repetitions, how much more will he discourage babbling? Right? If he says, doesn't repeat words that I can understand, that's, don't repeat that, don't, re don't do that. How much more he will say, don't make those noises. And but people will say, but, but, but he's praying in the spirit. Jesus, bring me Jesus again. Bring me Jesus again. Can anyone here say that Jesus never prayed in the spirit? Every time Jesus prayed, he prayed in the spirit. Right? Jesus always prayed in the Spirit. And when praying in the Spirit, and that means uh, from deep, his inner feelings and thoughts, when that happened, like at Gethsemane, when he was praying, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Do you understand that? Why? Because it was a known language. And he was praying in the Spirit. Jesus used a known language. So what is the sign of the Holy Spirit? We're almost done, friends. We're almost done. We'll fit you. We'll fit you. What is the sign, the manifestation of the feeling of the Holy Spirit? It's alive, saved, Changed, sent. Saved, changed, sent. Because when you are sent, the Holy Spirit gives you His power, you, His power to you. Yeah. Check what Acts chapter one and verse eight says. Jesus again, but you shall receive what, friends? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be, what is this power for? What is this power that you receive the Holy Spirit for? You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. When you are filled by the Holy Spirit, all that you want to do is to tell the world about your Savior. That's how you show that you are filled by the Holy Spirit. That's how you know that the Holy Spirit has taken care, has taken control of your life. That's how you know. That you are filled by the Holy Spirit. 
But who received this sign that is so important to receive? The power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be saved. The power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be changed. The power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be sent to bring more for Jesus. How can we receive that? The same Acts chapter 5 answers in chapter 5 and verse 32. It says, and we are his witnesses. Same topic to these things. And so also is whom, friends? The Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obedience how do you receive the holy spirit obedience why are you to get obedience into this picture see, since we were talking about other things because the bible jesus himself says in john chapter 14 verse uh, 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 chapter 14 verses 15 and 16 jesus says if you love me keep my commandments and what it will happen after this and i will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever the holy spirit comes to you to save you the holy spirit comes in you to change you and the holy spirit comes upon you to send you and he can give you any gift and all the gifts if he places the gift of tongues dear friends is biblical genuine and authentic there is no way to deny that the gift of tongue however is speaking in a language a person does not know in order to proclaim Christ to someone who does speak that language is that clear friends the true sign of the Holy Spirit then is a life transformed and in the service of the gospel of Jesus Christ Somebody who loves God and people so much, so much that he and she wants to share the gospel with them. The real sign of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is that he has started a work in you. And when he is bringing that work into confession, he is reaching out to more people for the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ.